I've been trying to the ages past, and making the laborious march of man's lee story with regard to his acquisition of positive knowledge, I find accurate conceptions, more or less mixed with the reflections of superstition and the colorings of fancy, of the realities pertaining to a higher sphere of human existence. At first, it was natural for the individual mind to be narrow in its conceptions, because its views were mainly derived from outward observations of the skies. But now, at an era when the human race is no longer in its infancy, the individual's reason can take in pure sentiments and larger conceptions, derived from discoveries of those unchangeable laws and principles which sustain and regulate the stupendous combinations of infinite harmonies. The intuition of past generations, like the totality of the reason of those now living, gives out no conflicting test in Rani on the physical possibility of an inhabitable sphere or zone of spiritualized matter in space, called recently the Summerland. It is no dream, remember, but a demonstration consummated at the lower end of Herschel's telescope. Scattered through the measureless expanse of blue ether, but in the very perfection of order and harmony, are groups of stars and systems of suns occupying in the heavens positions which are, to the unarmed eye, covered and filled with only boundless fields of nebulae. Scientific astronomy, by its marvelous discoveries, has thus expanded men's minds with respect to the fundamental magnitudes and planetary splendors of the material universe. The cosmogonies of illimitable space are fast coming into popular education. It is now conceded, even by anthropomorphists and other non-progressive religionists, that instead of the Earth being at the outer of God's universe, and instead of the doings and omissions of its denizens being the chief concern and perpetual misery of the entire trinity, our sun and its planets belong to the Milky Way not only, but that the Milky Way itself is merely one community of suns and planets of an infinitude of similar systems and communities that float and sing the songs of harmony in the celestial atmosphere of the Univercalium. Where are we, after all, asks an astronomer, but at the center of a sphere, whose circumference is 35,000 times as far from us as Sirius, and beyond whose circuit boundless infinity stretches unfathomed as ever. In our first conceptions, the distance of the Earth from the Sun is a quantity almost infinite. Compare it with the intervals between the fixed stars, and it becomes no quantity at all, but only an infinitesimal. Now, when the spaces between the stars are contrasted with the gulfs of dark space separating firmaments, they absolutely vanish below us. Can the whole firmamental creation, in its turn, be only a corner of some mightier scheme, a mere nebula itself? Probably Coleridge is not in error that it is not impossible that to some infinitely superior being the whole universe may be as one plane, the distance between planet and planet being only as the pores in a grain of sand, and the spaces between system and system no greater than the intervals between one grain and the grain adjacent. The next year of human existence is only another department in the great educational system of eternity. Their mankind do have opportunities to outgrow the errors and follies of this life, and thus innumerable myriads become prepared for another ascension. If a man leaves this world in good spiritual circumstances, he may possibly ascend at once to a better brotherhood, and be straightway engaged in higher duties, in obedience to higher sympathies and attractions. Those who can see what is beautiful are prepared to receive and enjoy what otherwise they could not. 
While those who go in darkness of spirit, who have brought upon themselves discord and misery, go there without these finer attractions and advantages, and of course they become subjects for the philanthropic treatment and attention of others who have souls for higher sympathies and the essence of a more beautiful happiness. Individual attractions and repulsions prevail very decidedly in some sections of the upper world. They cannot be wholly conquered by will, though they may be governed. Affinities and antipathies come from the action of the temperaments of different spirits in the vicinity of each other. When you pray, therefore, do more to pray for the highest manifestation of the Kingdom of Heaven, that is, for a social and national condition above the plane of these ungovernable attractions and repulsions, for blessings above the sphere of antipathies and unwise sympathies. The summer land, more especially those portions of it which are in connection with the inhabitants of Earth, appears to my interior eyes like a neighboring planet. It is the next room in the house not made with hands. But there are an infinite number of other rooms. Characteristics and peculiarities of the lower territories or sections may not prevail in any of the higher divisions of the sphere. When the eyes of the seer look higher, forth with many of those things which so distinctly prevail, as peculiarly adapted to the neighboring existence, utterly cease to exist, both out of the people and the scenery, as mankind progressively rise out of peculiar and special attachments, attractions, gravitations, and relations. In that section of the other sphere which lies next to us, the law of social attraction is as powerfully operative as it is in this world. It is not easy to tell why, but the dwellers are gregarious. They are attracted socially to remain very near each other, but higher up, or rather, away in more refined sections, the people are influenced by other interests. In fact, the Indian-like gregariousness becomes distasteful to those who seek and encourage the finer attractions of the summer land. Their new and higher and larger affections render their former selfish relations almost antipathies.